Well, good morning. It's, it's such an honor to be here. Uh, this is my, I think, sixth or seventh chance to visit Cleveland. I began with uh, uh, coming here with, to visit Kathy Lynn for the first time seven years ago and build plastic boats. And since then, I had a chance to sail you know, bigger boats you know, around the world. I want to start with an article from Life Magazine, 1955. Get my slides up. Where do I aim this? There we go. Okay, it's an interesting article. It's a good sign of the times. Going back in 1955, it's called Throwaway Living. And the first sentence I'll read for you, it says, the objects flying through the air in this picture would take 40 hours to clean, except that no housewife need bother. They are all meant to be thrown away after use. So this is the beginning of, of throwaway, this throwaway lifestyle we have. Prior to this was the age of conservation in the world, the Great Depression and the times preceding World War II. But after that, we get this throwaway culture, planned obsolescence, an abundance of materials with no real thought as to where they go. Well, in my talk, I want to talk about what I've discovered having sailed around the world and some of the solutions that are working in other cities and here in Cleveland. But I first want to tell you a bit about how I got here, how I got to Cleveland after, uh, um, after a few years. So if you, if you leapfrog here about 30 years, this is me in Louisiana where I grew up in the deep south. I've got an alligator there. This is a six and a half foot water moccasin. What's behind the person taking the photograph is a pond that my mother let me build with 96 turtles that I collected. Had a little homemade zoo. And I learned a very valuable lesson here. I had all this, my own little personal zoo. And I'd run home from high school and I would try to take care of these animals and I couldn't keep up. The alligator I had, it got loose somewhere in my neighborhood. I lost a few snakes. And I was seeing turtles were sitting on each other, they were biting each other, and within a few weeks I felt horrible, and I returned them all back to the swamp and didn't really keep many animals after that. M enjoyed much more going out into the field. And I learned some valuable lessons about overpopulation, resource scarcity, and pollution in that space. Well, fast forward another five years, and I found myself in the first Gulf War. So in the Deep South, it's very much a part of the culture there is here as well. You know, when you finish high school, if you don't, you know, run off and get a job, maybe you might go to college, a few people do in my neighborhood, but the rest of us join the military. And I found myself in the Marines in the first Gulf War, where I saw a very different, a different view of, of resource scarcity and, the, and what we will do to, to, to secure access to the resources of the parts of the world. When I came home from this experience, I mean, my mind was spinning for a long time, for another decade, just trying to understand where are we in the world? What's gonna happen throughout my lifetime? Things like population growth on the rise, biodiversity on the decline, waste generation on the rise, fisheries on the decline, greenhouse gas emissions on the rise, resource scarcity on the decline, plastic production escalating, and you can think after coming home from the war, I finished my degrees and my head was spinning. And I remembered by my early 30s of a promise I had made in the first Gulf War to a Marine buddy sitting in a foxhole next to me among all the burning oil wells of the time, if you remember the Gulf War, covered in oil and we're laughing about this idea to build a raft. He and I were both from New Orleans and we're thinking, let's build a raft like Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, and go down the Mississippi. And we're, we were brainstorming for a few days about this trip we would take. It took our minds off the war. If we survived, we would do this. The most recent Iraq war that began in 2003, when that happened, my head began spinning again and I couldn't find that Marine I had spoken with, but I built my raft anyway. And I had a friend drop me off in Lake Itasca, Minnesota. And that began a five month trip coming down the entire Mississippi River from start to finish. It was the most cathartic experience to reconnect with nature, with the land I love, and with people. 
And it gave me a, a, a good chance to, to sit, I mean, they're sitting five months on this thing as big as a twin, twin mattress, to think about where I want to be, what's worth fighting for. What I saw coming down the river was this, this unending trail of plastic, of plastic trash. And around the same time, Captain Charles Moore, a colleague of mine, just hit the media by storm with the idea of this garbage patch in the Pacific Ocean. And I'm sure you, you've all heard of this sensationalized myth of a Texas-sized island in the Pacific. Any of you have? I've gone through it a few times now in other parts of the world. So I began, my wife and I began the Five Gyres Institute, we began launching expeditions because no one knew about other garbage patches, just this mythical island of trash that doesn't exist. No one knew much about the eastern North Atlantic or the western North Pacific or anything south of the equator. And that began a, a six-year, 50,000-mile odyssey across the globe. So what we did, we launched expeditions to all five subtropical gyres. And gyres are these spinning systems of currents that rotate in the oceans. There are three in the south and two in the north. So my first expedition across the North Atlantic, we found something similar to what Charles Moore was finding. It's a few little fish on the surface, some biomass, and microplastic particles. So in the North Atlantic, we found the same thing as the North Pacific, went back to the North Pacific. All these little points you see, those are our data points, middle of nowhere. And the background is the oceanographic model predicts where the trash might be. North Pacific, the same thing. Here you can see toothbrush, there's a spray nozzle, and a small gorilla. The first time I'm catching a toy. Can you see it? So again, we were finding lots of microplastics and a few large identifiable items. Went south the equator, the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean, similar materials. You'll sometimes find, you know, a few big items. It's almost always fishing gear, the big stuff. It's designed to last, the big buoys and fishing nets. A lot of the small consumer products, I almost never find plastic bags in the middle of the gyres. If I do, I'll find just a knot where someone tied a bag in a knot and the knot survives. The rest is just shredded. Same for cups and other, other single-use throwing, throwing materials. They just don't last in the middle of the ocean. They break down to microplastics. Here's between Africa and South America, the same thing, microplastic particles. The oceans are not these islands of trash in the gyres. Around the Cape, from Valdivia, Chile, across the Easter Island, the same thing, microplastic fragments. So what I did, I took all of our data, and we collected about 800, no, actually 1,500 samples over six years, adding data from other colleagues, two ocean modelers. We used my data to populate the model, and we came up with the first global estimate of how much trash is floating in the world's oceans about a quarter million tons from 5.25 trillion particles. What's interesting is about 92% of that waste is microplastic, particles smaller than a grain of rice. Another interesting thing we observed in our data was that if you break down all the things we saw into four size categories, the bottom right being things bigger than a water bottle, the bottom left, water bottle size pieces down to a grain of rice. The top right are rice grain fragments. The top left, salt and pepper size fragments. What's fascinating is that if you look at the global distribution of those size ranges, the most abundant size is not the salt and pepper size fragments. It's the rice grain size fragments. What that told us is the smallest particles of plastic are not persisting on the ocean surface. The ocean surface, these subtropical gyres, these mythical islands, they don't exist. They're temporary places for plastic while it's fragmenting. So how we should look at plastic in the oceans is that our coastlines, especially countries that have very little or no or inefficient waste management, are the generators of trash. Also CSO, Combined Sewage Overflow, is a huge generator of trash. The subtropical gyres, they are the shredders, the shredders of plastics. And then the smallest particles, we think, are sinking down, become neutrally buoyant, and then they ride deeper currents around the world. 
This is what 5.25 trillion particles looks like. So the best metaphor, I think, for this issue of trash in the world's oceans is a plastic smog. Much like the smog over many of our, our cities years ago, where you had this fine particulate of, of carbon, other chemicals in the atmosphere that are settling down to the ground over time. In the oceans, the same thing, a fine particulate of hydrocarbons that's settling out over time. And the way we solve smog wasn't by taking butterfly nets and scooping the air. It was by, by, by stopping emissions stopping the problem at the source. Well, we see the same thing the oceans are going to apply. How can we stop the flow of trash to our, our rivers, our lakes, leading to the oceans? Well, all of that experience from my childhood, learning about how we treat other living things, and my experience in war, and I having sailed around the world, and then done the science, done the homework to realize where the solutions are. I discovered the solutions are not in the middle of the ocean. It's a good story, but it doesn't tell us, you know, I can't point to a country or a company when I'm holding a handful of microplastics in the middle of the ocean. It's, it, it is the ultimate tragedy of the commons. So if we go upstream, we can change things. And I had a chance a few years ago to meet Dr. Sam Mason from SUNY Fredonia. And she helped to organize an expedition on the flagship Niagara, a beautiful tall ship, I love tall ships, a chance to go around the Great Lakes and look for plastics. There's Sam Mason there with one of the, the pieces of equipment that, uh, that we build, uh, surveying about 21 sites in the Great Lakes. And you can see these, these are coded by, by the size dots. The biggest samples were sample 20 and 21, just kind of downstream from Cleveland and Erie. What was amazing, we were finding more particles by count than any of my ocean samples. Far more particles. Now, they were smaller, really small. You could fit all these on the head of a penny. But what's amazing, so, so Sam Mason and I, we went to a nearby pharmacy, and we've, we had a hunch where these might be, and I'm sure many of you know by now. We went to these facial scrubs and some toothpastes. And we found that these particles, these little colorful, small little spheres, they match the same size, color, shape, texture, the same polymer as the microbeads in facial scrubs and toothpastes. We had our match. We had a smoking gun. For the first time, we could, we were in national waters. We could say, okay, we're responsible for this. This is our waste. And we could point to a company. With that experience, what we're doing now at Five Jobs Organization, we're focused on research, but also leadership. I love tall ships, so just about two months ago, we're at sea again, and I invite you to come with me uh, maybe next year on a tall ship in the North Pacific. This is North Atlantic trip again, looking at where these plastics from the Great Lakes might go into. We had a crew of a very eclectic crew. There's Jack Johnson, the singer-songwriter, right in the middle next to the bag monster. And we were found all kinds of debris, uh, mostly small particles. When you do find the big stuff, there's a whole ecosystem growing under it. It's almost like plastics have created a new ecological niche in the oceans. So we, well, we left Miami to the Bahamas, Bermuda, up to New York City, sampling the sea surface, all the way until we got to New York City, just, out, just at the mouth of the Hudson River we were sampling. The biggest sample? was just beneath the new Freedom Tower, the mouth of Hudson River, sample 37 out of 38. And this, I'm convinced, is also combined sewage overflow from, from, uh, from New York City. You can recognize some things, tampon applicators, condoms, little, little small baggies and toothpicks, lots of plastic pellets. There's lots of, uh, lots of trash leaving New York City. Although the storm drains might capture a lot of the big stuff, there's an abundant amount of small material leaving. And you know that here in, in Cleveland as well. So I'm trying to tie the, the global to the local to see where, what the source is of, of plastics in the world's oceans, what we can do about it. So I think the way to look at one of the ma major inputs of trash in the oceans, it's not just you know, maritime activities, it's not just beachgoers or countries with poor waste management. 
Combined sewage overflow is a huge contributor of plastic waste to our lakes, rivers, and the ocean. And I think we, with, that mo with that metaphor of the plastic smog, I think we should look at cities as the horizontal smokestacks that pump that smog into the aquatic environment. That's the metaphor that makes the most sense, that's really backed up by the best science available right now. And in terms of the science, we've, we've published more papers on this issue in the last four years than the last four decades. We know enough now about this issue to act on it. And we're finding plastics, these small particles, and this is how important and urgent this is. And I like what you said about impatience. We've got to get this under the, under our, under our belt pretty soon. These are, this is work that Sam Mason is doing. She's furthered her research to look at fish. So she looked at, I think, 18 game fish in Lake Erie, and she found plastics in every one, including one cormorant, which means it's going up trophic levels into some of the predators on fish. These are some of the fibers and small particles found inside uh, some local game fish. And we know out in the world, we're seeing microparticles inside the base of the food chain. So you know, it's, it's, it's no longer this island of trash that's impacting one whale, one turtle. The distribution of plastic is now global, it's microplastic, and has ecosystem-wide impacts. When the small nanoparticles of plastics are being ingested by, uh, by the base of the food chain, and we also know those plastics, they become toxic over time. They are sponges for these persistent organic pollutants, to the point that a few of my colleagues published a paper recently arguing we should call plastics in the oceans a hazardous substance because of toxicity. We have found even the smallest particles can go through the gut barrier. This is taken from, from mussels, which you might find in, in, in many seafood restaurants. We're finding microfibers, microparticles inside their tissues. So the point is this trash, it comes back to haunt us in the food that we eat. The fish that we fish in the Great Lakes and the food in, uh, in your local seafood restaurant, potentially. So what's the end game for all this trash? We know that plastics do degrade, smaller and smaller particles. There's some low-level biodegradation happens to, the, to, to polyethylene, polypropylene. We have found pitting on the surface of some water bottles. In fact, Sam Mason, uh, we got some uh, scanning electron microscopic photographs of some of the small particles in the Great Lakes, and we found uh, covered in diatoms, biofilms that cover all the plastics uh, in the lakes. Fragmentation by grazing, lots of fish are nibbling at plastics, just shredding plastics really quickly in the oceans. Shoreline deposition, if you do beach cleanups here, anywhere in the world you'll see plastic on beaches. And deep sea deposition, even the most, the deepest waters on the planet we're finding microplastics, including here locally. Here's one paper just published just this year showing microparticles of plastics in, in sediments in the Great Lakes. So I think the end game for plastics, if we can shut off the tap and turn off the tap of trash going into our lakes and rivers, we will have to live with this layer, this almost this fossilized stratigraphic marker in geologic history that marks our time on this planet, this thin layer of plastic waste that will go global. It is, it's a good index fossil for, for our existence. So how do we solve it? How do we get to the point where we turn off the tap? What do we have to do? What I've noticed, and this is with every issue, every environmental issue on the planet, whether it be you know, nuclear power, seat belts or smoking, whatever it is, after a decade or so, it achieves a, 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 a point of maturity where the science is pretty solid and stakeholders begin to, to dig in their heels. And I've seen that happen with this issue. I've been involved in this for about 15 years now, and I've seen stakeholders dig in their heels. And the division, and this isn't a black and white division, it's, there's a lot of gray area between industry and conservation. What I'm looking for are ways to bridge the gap, bridge, bridge the gap. So I began with the circular versus linear economy. I had a chance to visit Vadex. It's a company that turns plastics into petroleum yesterday. And they sit on the, the very end of the linear economy, where we extract materials to make plastics. We, we 
make a product, we consume it, and it goes to the landfill or energy recovery. The other model is the circular economy, designing in the product a way to get the material back so it stays within this continuous loop. And if you can't keep your stuff in the loop, if you're losing it before it goes to waste energy or a landfill, then have it go to a biological cycle. Switch back to paper metal glass, those environmentally less harmful materials. Waste diversion versus waste energy or your landfill. Waste diversion, we're seeing, I was very impressed to hear that you, now the whole city has blue bins. That's an efficient way to manage this resource of waste. We're seeing, uh, what's been happening across the globe, you're seeing open pit landfills, lots of landfilling and waste to energy. The alternative, I was just spent a week in Chile where was one company, Tricyclos, is putting these bins all around the city of Santiago. And here, you voluntarily, for now, you divide all your trash into all these different categories, all your plastics, metal, and paper. Pretty impressive system of, of waste recovery. Designing for zero waste or recycling and waste management. Management should be over there. Designing for, for, for recovery. We're seeing, or designed for zero waste, materials or products being designed with recovery in mind, with repair, with remanufacture, with recovery of the materials, like this chair where all the components, you could easily take one wheel off and replace it, unlike your blender where one button falls off, the whole thing is trash. So we're finding innovations in design products. Then we're seeing innovations in waste recovery. I'm not sure if, if the Cuyahoga River has a way to capture any, any floatables coming downstream. Lots of momentum. Flotsam and jetsam, or momentum. Well, this, uh, I just photographed this in Baltimore a few months ago. It's not just a beautiful thing, but it's a water wheel, no power needed to, has a, to drive a conveyor belt that pulls trash into a bin. So we're seeing lots of innovations happening, and here in Cleveland as well. I just learned that Metro Parks has taken over your, your coastline to sort of to care for and embrace the fact that you are a green city on a blue lake. And with the, the Burning River Festival, embracing that concept as well, that we can enjoy the river, enjoy, enjoy the lake, and take care of it. Things always come down to this, you know, who pays? And then who is responsible for this? Is the taxpayer who has to pay to fund all of these, these programs, all the waste management, or the industry? Or well, we're in the middle of that debate now. Just last week, California banned the sale of products containing microbeads. And I know here, Erie County did as well. Thank you. And this began here. This began here in the Great Lakes, this research. And this story, it's applicable, I think, across the board. With good, solid science, and this issue of plastic pollution, we're there now. We know enough to act. The argument that we need more research doesn't work anymore. So here in the Great Lakes, we found this problem. Unlike the oceans, which are tragedy of the commons, we could point to a country and a company, and we went to Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson first. And they offered phase-out dates, but some companies didn't. So our strategy was, let's make it level, across the field. Let's go for a policy that says, let's just not put the stuff in our, our, our products. It pollutes the lakes, and it works. It's working across the country. Right now, California is one of the largest markets for these products. It's going to shake up the system. It's going to shake it up globally. And it's all thanks to what began here in Cleveland. If you want to come see this for yourself, this was my last slide, final pitch. We're going to sell a tall ship from LA, Hawaii, and back, inspiring leadership. If you want to sponsor one young person to come join us, it's, there's nothing like being out in the middle of the ocean to see the sea for yourself. Thank you very much. I got 10 minutes? Oh, we've got 10 minutes for, for Q&A. Any Q? I might have an A. Hi. 
Looks like you've done a fabulous job in your work, and I wondered if you could take off on the pharmaceuticals that are going into all the water now. What do you do about pharmaceutical waste? I'm not sure. My brother works for Glasgow Smith Klein, so we talk a lot about this. We'll sit in his, his truck out there fishing in Louisiana, and we'll just start going off on. We almost stop the conversation at, it's your fault. No, it's your fault, and then keep fishing. Um, I'm not sure what to do about it. So some of the compounds are persistent pollutants. They'll stick around for a while, and some we're finding in, in, in groundwater, deep down in groundwater. Um, I know in Los Angeles they're trying to, to change the path of the river to create more bioswales, so you can let water sit, and some of the pharmaceuticals will biodegrade if they sit in one place for a long time. Um, I don't know much more than, than that about pharmaceuticals. So perhaps we can talk after, I can learn some from you. It's a big field and it's deep pockets. Uh, we've had the birth control pill for 50 years in our water streams. We now have triplets uh, being born of deer. And it, there's a connection in the well, water. There is, there is a connection with the estrogenic compounds we see. And some of those come from plastics and from pharmaceuticals. So I, I can address some of that. Like uh, bisphenol A, uh, phthalates, um, these are plasticizers and polycarbonate. Uh, and um, phthalates turn PVC to vinyl. Those endocrine disruptors, we are seeing those changing, you know, the uh, in very critical windows of the development of lots of organisms. Very small, small concentrations of bisphenol A and other endocrine disruptors from pharmaceuticals can change the, their development. We've seen that recently in rockfish off the coast of California. I'd be curious to know if it's happening here in the Great Lakes as well. If there's any relationship between some of those estrogenic compounds from pharmaceuticals and, uh, and fish development in the Great Lakes. Going back I want to your comment to about... A lot of the stuff that's happening is uh, because we have a loose definition of civilization. Uh, and uh, a lot of the problems we have now is because we got civilized. And yet we are now trying to uh, reverse that process of, of civilization, what, what would you think the solution will be for, well, capitalism depends on production of pharmaceuticals, you know, how are you going to change that so that there is a synergy between capitalism Civilization. I think I understand what you're, what you're asking. I, I think the bridge of that great divide is, one is the big corporation model, where a corporation, their bottom line isn't just you know, their quarterly profits. It's, it's a mission statement they adopt about how they, how they treat people on the planet. Like the mayor said, he wants Cleveland to be a city where you know, you know, we're not exploiting people and resources and situations for, for, for short-term gain. Now we're thinking far into the future. So the B Corporation model is, is, one, uh, is one way to bridge that gap so that there isn't this, this loss of materials. You think of companies today, you, you now have potentially 8 billion customers in around the world. You can't make one little widget without not having a plan for it. So I think having efficient ways to, to get your materials back in the system, to deal with waste management, it, it has to happen. And I'm seeing it happen. It is happening uh, around the world. Yeah, you, you mentioned about uh, combined sewer or overflows as uh, sources of the microparticles. Uh, have, have you looked, I mean, in Cleveland, we're you know, a couple billion dollars into sh shutting most of those down. Have you uh, looked into how effective are the sewer, the, the treatment plants at removing those particles? That's a very good question, because uh, this is something that plagues, <coughs> it plagues the planet, and it plagues the U.S. Um, the, the folks I've spoken with, for example, in Los Angeles, we have, a, we have a few big plants, the two of the biggest ones, one, its output is offshore, so we can't uh, analyze that, uh, that effluent. The Tillman plant, further, further up um, inland, they polish their water down to 10 microns, so they're getting out much of the plastics. Uh, what they are losing are some of the plastic fibers and a lot of the synthetic chemistry, pharmaceuticals, for example. Uh, but that's pretty good, 10 microns. 
Um, you don't get much plastic. I have done some sampling of the effluent there, a downstream of it, so I'm getting some, uh, some urban, uh, uh, I guess, wash. And I will find some fragments of plastics, film, and, and little bits of fibers. They may come from the plant, or they may come from just you know, plastic bags and debris that's degrading in the local neighborhood. Um, I would like to, to, to know more about, about, you're saying you're $2 billion into controlling CSO in Cleveland. I mean, the, you're potentially a model city for the nation to follow, how to deal with this old method of CSO. I, I, I was really amazed, I was shocked to go into New York, uh, New York City in the Hudson River and see that much trash. I mean, there was easily, I'd say five times more plastic in that one sample I showed you than any other sample I collected uh, going around uh, the North, North Atlantic. So our cities really are these horizontal smokestacks pumping trash into the oceans. So I, perhaps uh, one answer could be much better waste management um, in terms of improving the, the, the quality of how well you polish your water leaving, a, leaving your, your effluent. Um, others might be some of the products. Uh, what's going down into your, into your drains? You've got a lot of, you have some plastics being used in the seniors throwaway culture that don't need to be plastics. Tampon applicators, little cigar tips we see, um, little toothpicks. And also there are some controls on plastic pellets that we can implement. In California, we had a Assembly Bill 258, the Nurdle Bill, which stopped the flow of pellets which we're finding on every beach, millions of pellets in our, in our watersheds. So there are some things that you can do, innovations in design and some legislation to stop the flow of common products and improve just the way you polish your water and your waste treatment. But I, I'd love to learn more about how, how Cleveland is tackling this, because I know you're in the middle of it. One how does, excuse me, um, how does climate change interact with the five gyres and how does it affect the plastic pollution? And also, do you think the ocean cleanup boyon slot project is worth doing? I can start with, uh, with, with boyon slot's approach. He's a young man, he's mid-20s, who plans to clean up the ocean gyres with a big giant net. Um, his idea is about five years old. It goes back when we thought that there were these islands of trash in the oceans. His recent big mega expedition, he collected mostly fishing gear. What he didn't catch, he's a bit late in the game if you go in the middle of the ocean and capture trash, he's missing all the single use disposables. If you wanna capture most of the trash leaving the oceans, go upstream. I mean, infrastructure to, uh, to catch trash before it leaves the land is the best bet. When, he, when his idea was first proposed, we've now doubled the amount of research that's been known. It's just not, it's not feasible. Uh, there are much more efficient ways to go about capturing